So I'm really excited to uh, hear about this this morning myself as well, because I can continue to talk about this. So, you know, when you, when you start to have a look at Tina's thesis and you understand the importance of taking in an indigenous approach to the research that we do, the reasons we're, we're giving you these lectures over these three weeks is just to show that there's multiple ways of doing that. And for you to think about what works for you as you design your little mini tiny research project that is not a PhD, it's a <laughs> diploma action research, right? So it doesn't need to be as big as some of the things that we've been hearing about from the previous speakers, okay? But listen to the approaches and listen to the thinking behind um, you know, why people did what they did and what was important to them. Why is it important that Kukara does it? So, welcome to you. Uh, and don't forget, you're allowed to ask questions. Alright? It's good to ask questions because it means your brain is in the It's good to be uh, thinking outside the square. So, thanks so much. So, Grazie. 
about the design, and then I'll talk a little bit about the actual research itself and some of the things that, that came out of it. Um, what, what's type time wise? What are you expecting? An hour. An hour? To, is it like, like a 10 o'clock start or just a. I've got two. Yeah, I've just got this. Yeah, yeah. Just got it. All good. Pretty crazy. <laughs> So then we get into, our, so then that sets us up with our positionality. And our positionality <coughs> is really about, it's a strategy um, used to, to contextualise the research, the things that, the observations that we make and uh, the, the way that we interpret the information that we're seeing. So understanding our positionality, made up of our subjectivities, gets us to this place of being able to lose, kind of understand the way in which we are interpreting the information, the way in which we're carrying out our, um, our we're carrying out our methods and doing those in other parts. So the way that we check that is through our reflexivity. So it's so how we reflect on the things that we're doing and the decisions that we're making. And so as teachers, you're aware of this whole idea around reflective practice, right? You're looking at your teaching all the time, making changes, making adjustments based on where the, it's, it's working or it's not working. And so it's a similar idea about, so throughout the research process, we're reflecting on our practice, we're reflecting on our research, we're reflecting on our relationships and all of those things that are going on as a way of checking and maintaining the, the, you know, the values and the commitments that we've made as part of our research design. Right? With me? Alright. 
done with that. So, um, I want to talk about some immersive research design. So, we've talked about, I'm, I'm now using the term indigenous, which is not the same as indigenous. So, when we say indigenous, we're talking about you know, us as people from a particular location connected to our place. And, 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 and so that's research that's carried out about, you know, so we could say, okay, it's us as, as Cook Islanders born here or from, descended from here doing research about this place. Indigenous is a bit broader than that because it includes people who may not be from here but operate, have a connection, whether it be through their, you know, people and who also um, carry out the research based on the particular way it's designed. So it's saying, so what I'm saying is that you don't have to be a Cook Islander to do Indigenous research. You don't have to be Māori to do Māori based research, necessarily. So, I mean, so as opposed to research that is just by Māori for Māori, just by a particular Indigenous group for you kind of opens up the space to be able to include others in their research process. Um, so the key thing about that is that we're saying that researchers
And so the other part of that is that um, it's about privileging Cook Island scholars and researchers. So I purposely looked, tried to find Cook Islanders that were producing research to help me design mine. And that's ahead of Western scholars and scholarship. Because you know, there are a dime a dozen there everywhere. And, um, and you, know, the, you know, our whole world is full with research by different <coughs> scholars and researchers. And very few, particularly at the PhD level, are done by Cook Islanders. And in fact, you know, we could probably count them on our fingers and toes who they are and we know them. And so in the research you'll see that in that chapter I refer to the likes of D.B. Um, Evelyn Masters, um, uh, Te Awa, um, uh, um, Tism, Jonah Tism, um, who's the other one? Um, but, but those ones in particular because they try to make use of indigenous knowledge. We have others, other Cook Islanders that have done research, but they can't necessarily use, try to use indigenous or Cook Island um, methods or values or thinking in the way that they've designed the research. And so that little group there is all we've got at the moment. So we need more of this um, to build that up. Tina, um, we've got a question. Um, can you explain in your own um, explanation, what do you mean? I know what relationship stands for me, but I don't know this, but can you explain in your terms what do you mean uh, that indigenous people are not in relation, they are relationships? So, as a fund of, in, in, in research, yeah. when we look at, when we're carrying out our research, one of the key things that we are taught uh, traditional kind of conventional ways, Western ways of teaching research or looking at research, is that it focuses on the information that you get. It's on the data. Whereas when we look into the work that has been done by Indigenous research, and Carl was a good example of that, she talks about this notion of the bar. Now we have this term in the books, you know, Tom and Sam with Tom Hill work around this idea of VAR. And VAR is this idea of space. And so, and so the focus is on space, not, and it's between two things. So if you look at the, uh, you know, like the passage, it's got two sides and there's a gap. So it's not an empty space. There's something happening in there. You know, it's full of something. Passage. A space is not something that is empty and a void with nothing in it. It's a space that is occupied and that's where we are. We, we occupy that space between things. It's a space that's, that's negotiated, it's full of something, there are things going on in there. And so from an indigenous perspective, when we think about ourselves, we are that space of relationships, of negotiation, of, of it was an occupied, flexible, negotiated space. And so by thinking about indigenous research and this idea of part, that's this idea about we are not in a relationship, we are that space, we are that gap. And so, and I talked to Aki about this a few years ago about this idea of art. And I said, you know, we don't really use that term, you know, or understand it like that. Although, you know, it can mean that the same as the way that Tom and Sam Holmes interpret it. And, 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 so, um, and so, I purposely, even though I make reference to it in the other chapters, I really don't, I don't dwell on it because, you know, it would just become a distraction. Trying to get into an academic debate about what does the bar mean in the book 
ones are tips because it can mean the same or it can be different, but it's not a commonly used term in this kind of way. But we can make it one if we were going to our research based on this idea of class. So, you know, and this is, and instead, what we were offered was this idea of pitya. That is a concept of connection and it's the same idea about relationships. That's the key thing. It's our kind of like this a lot in there. And that's who we are. We are relationships. So that's the only thing that the research does is try to privilege um, Cook Island scholarship and researchers. So lots of bureaucrats. Um, based, based mainly here in the 
books and some um, from the uh, New Zealand um, foreign affairs. And then I did my observations in, in four different ways. So one of them is that I observed the Cook Island delegates preparing for a big um, climate conference that was held in Paris in 2015. So in the lead up to that, I would go with them, attend their meetings, um, and you know, kind of get involved in discussions about what we with. So observing them how they dealt with the issues that they had to deal with. <coughs> and then uh, I went to, um, uh, you know, I did that, and so I, I interviewed people over here, I interviewed people in um, New Zealand, uh, and, um, and in Samoa, because it was the UN um, Small Island about SIDS conference, so this conference is held once every 10 years, so I went to that and observed, you know, you just, like you go to a conference and you go to different workshops, so you participate in it, but you also are watching and making note of who's saying what, why are they saying that, you know, all those kind of things. Like the Prime Minister stood up in one of, at one of them <coughs> at the SIDS conference and he was a, a um, keynote speaker. And in his uh, speech he talked about how, you know, he's I'm the Prime Minister of a small country, of, of, a, of a country with 14 different islands, you know, I have to, you have to have 13 schools, 13 hospitals, 13 harbours, da 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 da, he listed all this, this stuff. And he said, you know, out there in the world that does not make, people would argue that that's not economic, that doesn't make economic sense to do that. Because it just costs a lot of money. And he said, but for us it makes island sense. And so, what's he referring to when he said that? He was referring to there's an island perspective of how we look at our economy. There's an island perspective of how we look after our people and how we develop as a country, which was very different from normal economic kind of talk back here. So, you know, just from observing that particular um, speech, I thought, wow, that's interesting. What was also interesting about that is that. Who wrote that speech? Who was even part of But one of his colleagues, one of his staff, wrote that speech. And I thought, see, this is about subjectivity. See, these people are not seen. Like, here's the Prime Minister saying all of this, gets all the kudos, no disrespect to him. But behind there, this is what the ethnography gets you to see is what's going on behind him. That is somebody else wrote that. <coughs> And it was his chief of staff at the time. That was, was the new, you know, our commissioner to New Zealand. Let's write all together. So she wrote it. Yes. <coughs> and then, and because I stayed, and this is the other part about participant observation, I stayed with them, um, the delegates, there was eight of them, they all stayed in a room in the house in Samoa. So I had one of the beds there. This is how I was very privileged to be able to get that close seeing all of this stuff happen and they said um, and there was a session going on. The Prime Minister was also about to give another address and um, <coughs> Alan Clark was going to be on the panel so he was one of the panel four. And so and I just I love this because there were all of us, there were the eight of us, the Prime Minister with you of course, um, and they were working on his speech. Because you know, it was like, I don't know, because other things have been said before. So, this whole process of going through and getting the words right uh, and um, being able to get that speech ready. You know, and, that's, and then it gives you an insight into what these officials have to do. You know, we think of them all out here swimming about being great all the time. But that, that, so, they gave me a, a great appreciation of what it takes to be able to operate in that of uh, issues and to then understand my topic, which we'll get to in a second. So those are the kind of things that you get from participant observations being able to see those kind of details with that kind of information. Um, one more talking. 
Okay, so this is the issue that I'm looking at. So you will have your topics, and it was around the mobility as a result of climate change, and that we see this in countries like Tuvalu and Kiribati, with sea level rise, that people are losing their land. And in fact, it's happening in places like Penrith right now, right? And in Pukapuka. Um, <clears throat> so this is not an issue that's you know, out there somewhere else. This is an issue that's happening here. So, this was, so remember, this, I did this in 2015. This is five years ago. Um, and so people look at the issue of, like, of um, migration as and you can look at it in relation to climate change as a consequence of so people move because they're, they're losing their land or and the other part is that people are saying it's looking at migration as a solution you know like this is how you solve the problem is that we leave so, uh, so there's a tension in there already about you know and so um so that, that and so there's all these different implications for it i won't go into all that it's just to give you to frame up the kind of the research itself uh, and then you can categorise the migration process, you know, that people migrate um, because of an emergency. So, like we saw with Cyclone Martin, like we've seen with uh, Native in 2010 with Cyclone Pat, people had to move temporarily because there was a crisis of emergency going on right there, which was Cyclone. So people moved for that kind of reason. Um, that it's induced, where it's not really a sudden event, it's just a kind of a slow thing that over time, you know, actually things are happening and we just can't, um, we just can't, you know, it just kind of slowly contributes to <coughs> where people become having to move. And even if they just move further inland from where they normally, you know, uh, and then, Change mobility. The 
key thing about that, and you see this, and, and then after this, is, there's a number of objectives, but we won't get into all of that. So, you know, there's just these little sub things that help answer that big question. And so, one of the sub questions is around cross border mobility. And people automatically assume we're talking about leaving the cook, so international migration. In actual fact, cross border can also be borders within an island. So you move from one tapere to the next, or one village to the next, or another village within an island. Or it can be inter internal migration, where we move from one island to another island, as we see the people migrating into Rotoma, uh, as well as this international migration. So, you know, getting your question right and then understanding what are all of the concepts that sit inside it or all the kind of avenues that your question could take you down is something that you, you had an idea about it at the start and actually you get more clear about it at the other end. The other thing I can say about this question is that it changed from what it originally started out to be. This is how it ended up in the thesis. It certainly didn't start out like that. It was a lot more waffling and I can't remember I had something else. I think I had land loss and couple of other things in there, they got the job. So this is what will happen with your research, is that you'll get to the end and go, I'm not really answering that question. So you can either change your answer, or you just change the question. <laughs> yeah. um. <clears throat> okay, so you have some So 
and that respect, you know, so I have some experience of this, but this is where, you know, talking to the people in our research, you know, really helped me understand some of these ideas. And a key person uh, in this study was um, Paya, Paya Paitai, and his, um, as, a, as a navigator, as a traditional uh, master navigator. And so, you saw in that front page, that, that first, slide there was a shot of the back of the canoe of the bucker with the flag on it well that was when i was interviewing him that's where the interviews took place was on 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 the on the bottom of two in auckland uh at Tauranga harbour is that vessel was being prepared to be sailed uh, delivered to another country in pacific so that's where research takes place it doesn't have to take place in that private little office somewhere, it can take place at the beach, you know, maybe some of them in the Tumanu, I don't know. But you know, the location of where research takes place is all a part of um, uh, the things that we to think about. So, and, um, and he was a, so he was talking about voyaging, he was talking about the canoe and its construction, <coughs> as well as other, other, other parts of it. He wasn't necessarily talking about how change we were talking about that, we were talking about the whole um, use of this metaphor and you know, what is that really like. <clears throat> and you will find that too, that if you find a particular metaphor that you want to use to design and explain your research with, then you know, it may be that you need to talk to somebody else who is an expert in that. So, hey, what's that mean? Um, and there's also stuff that's been written about it. So, the two critical components of it, and you'll see that labelled up there, is the katia and the ama. So the left and the right side of the two baka. So there's two different baka, each have a name, each have a position. And so the way that I used them was as representing uh, the ama was the left side. So um, that came to represent the female side. That came to represent the people and their mobility side of this issue, climate change and migration. So it became, a, a, so that's, and then the right side was climate change. You no, know, it was kind of like the, the male side, the rational the thinking side, as opposed to the emotional, caring side, and that represented science. And, um, and climate change is very much a science-driven uh, phenomenon, as we see it. And so, um, uh, and that these, and that, that in our Kupala's context, climate change and mobility, our movement, we're not at this time seen as connected issues. And in fact, they're still not. Only now we start to see some policy movement around this. But we, so they were these two discrete canoes, unconnected. And so of course the thing that connects them is the ata ata, not that much. And that's the platform. And that represents the kind of the institutions, the policies, the frameworks, the regulations, those kind of formal government things that connect these two issues. Because we're talking about policy space here, right? And so they're connected by these formal institutions and policies and regulations. And that, um, and it's looking at how do we connect these two issues in our kind of technical governmental kind of way? What are the things that connect them? Uh, and then the third one, third part of this is the um, the oi which is the steering wheel, right? And that represents the agency of actors. It represents the people and their capacity to act with intent to do something about an issue. And so that's whether the government officials or whatever it is, it's about the agency of people to create some kind of change or take some kind of action. That's what that represents. And then the tira and the kie, the mast and the sail, represent sovereignty. And as a concept, I'm not talking about the rigid, hard sovereignty that you get from legalistic terms. I'm talking about sovereignty that is 
seen as being a malleable, flexible and negotiated concept. Um, and that, and as you can see, this is a double hold, a uh, double mastered bucker. And that, you know, I think this is actually quite good because we have uh, our sovereignty is tied to New Zealand. So I think we've got two sails on our on our bucker to mass sales. We don't always have to use both sails. But we have the flexibility to drop up, you know, to not use both of them. We can actually get by on our own steam with just one sail. So I thought that was kind of a good thing to represent us and our sovereignty and the way in which we make decisions and what we use to make decisions with them. Sometimes it's with both sales and sometimes it's um, and so, and all, and all together, they create this kind of um, dynamic, island-centered, Cook Island-centered perspective of our policy space when it comes to making decisions about particular issues. You know, you could swap out those two hull and put in other types of concerns. A project that I'm working on now is looking at climate change and new development of being. And so the idea is that we replace them mobility um, fuck up with the, the health, mental health and well-being one. This is a project I'm working on with Melissa. So you know, we're trying to see if we can do something more with this metaphor. Uh, and then um, uh, the next one is in relation to Function key, function file, function eight. Here we go. Yeah, 
everything goes on, um, then we're, we're that we're vulnerable. You know, that we can't apply for ourselves and that we can't do that without external help. So there's lots of literature that kind of talks about these dominant discourses about how small island states are viewed. And um, so that's you know part of the debating wins. This is where the sort of one by sits in that context of these dominant discourses that tell us tell us things about our world that actually we might have another perspective on. So they might tell us things about our language and we certainly will have another perspective. Use. And so, um, so the way in which it's used is can convey all kinds, you know, can be used for all kinds of purposes and missions. And that the bucket is used is actually like an island in itself. It's a mobile bucket. It's on the move, but it's a self-contained island. The crew on that they look after each other. They know how to operate. They know how to feed themselves. They know how to basically survive. On, on the bucket. And so there's this idea then that, um, that, are, that are used to argue that the bucket one is about islanding policy spaces. It's about how we influence our own policy spaces. How do you influence policy around, you know, the, the, our language? And, and that, these are, but that these spaces are occupied spaces. They are negotiated spaces, and this is going back to what I was saying about this idea of life. Um, and that they are spaces where you know we can fulfill our purposes and our future by reorientating our perspective around how we're dealing with these, how we're using this kind of thinking to advance different perspectives. Whatever you're doing, you will find this kind of 
knowledge to be able to, you know, help you with your research. And so I use this as an example of indigenous <coughs> narratives or indigenous our own Cook Island um, just knowledge that's, that we can draw on. It's not that it's invisible or it's hidden. It's just that you have to know what you're looking for to be able to make use of it. And and so. And so I was saying, and, and so to counter these dominant discourses about, you know, so you would see this with, your, with the language work people doing, and particularly with this policy <coughs> space stuff, that, was, that there are other ways in which to look at island state development. So I was, so then from there, and the way that we look at our mobility and the way we look at climate change. And so <coughs> one of the narratives that came out was this idea around Tere. And so Tere is a action, you know, is a doing the work, work, and as a noun. And so people in the research talk about, well, you know, we've always been on the move. You know, this whole issue around, it's not like we're stuck and we're never ever gonna, you know, we, we have a tradition, we have a tradition of move of, of, of being on the move. And so, you know, rather than look at climate change and this idea of <coughs> Forced migration from that kind of perspective, we need to understand that actually we are highly mobile people, that some of us stay, some of us move so that some of us can stay, that some of us uh, will move and come back through our life cycle. That you know, some might go to New Zealand, but you know, 30 years' time they come back, that's not about being in my life, it's about um, abilities. So there's this whole discussion around mobilities that came out of, out of um, the research that is like this alternative narrative, this alternative argument that we can put forward. And so, you know, in your research, you will find these alternative arguments based on what, based on your, um, on your question, on the answers to your question. And so this idea that um, in this one or two there are, it's a, it became a way to be able to explain this different information that, that was important and that was, um, uh, okay, I feel like I've said too much. Thank you. 
and it was just an, and in the in my first year with it, so to be able to be in a position where you are now to say I am adopting this indigenous specific perspective approach from the outset, you know, you kind of say it can have that, that didn't come from me until the way around within the well I knew that part of it, but the actual what it looked like, the framework of what you want, that didn't come until the third year. And that was actually you know what happened was in the when the canoe the yeah. fire when there was the fire on the bucket in the harbour and it put on fire. And because at that time I was just trying to I was trying to sort my framework out. I knew that it had come in there and I just, you know, these different kind of parts to it, but the actual details didn't come until then. And um, and then I put the When I was doing my um, proposal, you know, I had these, you know, you have to do a conceptual framework. It's kind of like this map of what your research is going to look like, the key words you're going to use, and your ideas. <coughs> and I had my little drawn up on a map with islands and, a, and canoes kind of moving around, so I knew right from the beginning that there's something to do with islands and canoes are going to be mine. So did you follow it according to your map? Yeah, kind of changed, changed. <laughs> One of the things that my supervisor said to me, and you know, and I thank them for it because it, because I was really because I was focused on indigeneity, I was focused on sovereignty, and, um, and they said to me, you've got to let one of them go because it's just too big. You know, your, pro your proposal can't, it's just got too much in it, you've got to let one of them go. They said, park up indigeneity. And you know, I was like, don't make me do it. Um, and so, but you know, you just have to have faith and trust, and that's basically what it was. I said, you know, I'm just going to put that to the side again and push this along. And what do you know? It just came right back in there because we were talking about indigenous sovereignty and it just became the kind of the, the core of everything else just came off it. So it became a central part of the research, right? You know, but you had to let it go for it to come back. Well, I did. Other people will have that clarity right from the get go. And I think, you know, it wasn't my experience. And you, you probably have the same thing in a short region. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm interested. This is something that you could use, not necessarily the bucket one, but this idea that you can, you know, look to your own yeah. knowledge, <coughs> your own experiences mm. to come up with these things. You know? They're there, they're just right there. I really encourage you to. Mm. This sounds like, like, just listening to you just saying that the last few lines, like, <coughs> make it small, but it's actually more, eh? But you try one way, doesn't work, try another way, or try something else. You got to be more easy, but time to be there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You might not think of the right advice at the time, but you trust them enough to let you, you know, to help you just kind of take take you forward with it. And so this will be with Debs and Karina and others. Okay, okay. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, You know, because you just because you know that other people they've been through the process, they know what this is about, they know your subject, or you know, they know the, the parameters of your research. <coughs> and you have to put a bit of faith in them, trust in your advice to get you to those next steps. But it'll be you with the old hallelujah moments going, yeah, I found that out.